we will dive right in. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Okay, so I started with a file new uh, with one exception, or well, two exceptions. Um, I did bring in a, a graphic of a venue that we're gonna build in a little bit. I just stuck it on a magic sheet so you all can see it. So that's the only thing that I've pre pre prepped for this. Um, the, you know, obviously the hope is that you will, you know, be building your own venue or your own uh, studios or scenery or, or whatever you're going to put into augmented. So you're you're welcome to follow along with me as I build this venue, um, but uh, you certainly don't have to. Um, so just a couple uh, kind of overarching statements before we begin. So today again, we are going to only be using the the built-in objects and tools in augmented and we are going for representational objects and, and, and venues we're not trying to be photo realistic this is not um you know we're not trying to create something like capture or visualization program would and be as completely realistic as possible you know sometimes we might need to put a table in and we actually have a folding table, but we put a picnic table on stage or, or something like that. So it's as long as the dimensions are, are close or, you know, as close as possible, then it's going to function as a programming tool just fine. So for today, we're mostly going to be focusing on venues, on building a, a venue. We'll do a little bit with objects. Uh, there is a, a huge stock library of things that we will not be getting into today. We'll kind of browse through them real fast in case you haven't seen it yet. Uh, but we'll mostly be focusing on on venues today. And again, we we will not be importing anything. Um, everything will be in the in the software. So I'm going to start with uh, the built-in stock venues. So if you are in your augmented uh, editor, uh, we'll open that up, and then in your library, we have all of our stock uh, objects here, and there is a venues section. And the so the one caveat that I mentioned earlier is in preparation for this class, we learned that there was a little uh, mistake in these, uh, which I'm going to show you here. So the here's our traverse stage, and I'll pull that up. So the uh, the error, and this will be corrected in a in a future software version, um, but you you will have to deal with it for a little while. Is the if I explode this or expand this and come in here, and if I go to, let's take one of my Persini marches, for example. Um, if I go to make that taller, the, the Y and Z are backwards. So this is going to, uh, Z is going to make it move on the Y axis, and the Y is going to move it on the Z axis. Uh, and the reason for that is, and we discovered this this week, uh, the, this folder here in the hierarchy is rotated by 90 degrees. So we, we can fix that, but then our, our whole venue is sideways. So not super helpful. Uh, so uh, for today, uh, I have a, a set of models that have been fixed. So we're not struggling with this throughout the whole presentation. Um, but if you're doing this on your own before we have the fix for it, just know that your Y and Z uh, may sometimes be flipped. So that's that's really it. So apologies for that, but you know, we we just found it, so we will we will work on getting that fixed. So I'm going to delete the traverse stage, and we are going to start with the black box. Okay. So the the rest of these venues, like I said, have been corrected, so they will work properly for us for for me today. Um, okay. So we have a handful of stock venues here. We've got a couple black boxes. Um, some in the round, a proscenium thrust, and a traverse. So if we bring one of those into our model, um, the black box, large and small, uh, we're going to work with the large one here today, but they behave exactly the same. They're just, they start out as, as different sizes. I'm going to zoom that out a little bit. So the first thing I want to point out, actually, let me delete my ground here. So that's not in our way. We do get a ground by default anytime we start a new model. And I'm going to take that out. Okay. So the first thing I want to show you is as we rotate around these venues, we have some special handling for their walls. So you can see as we're looking at any given wall, it's going to disappear so that we can see through it into our venue. We can build these from scratch as well, and we'll look at that. 
uh, in just a moment. Um, but it's just it's a tool designed to to help you work in your space. So this wall here uh, is still there. We just it's allowing us to see through it, sort of like a, a one way mirror kind of idea. And there's some other special objects that work that same way. So the first thing we can do is uh, I'm going to select that, and we can change the size of the entire room altogether. So if maybe this is a 60 by 60, and we'll say it is a 30 foot high ceiling. Okay, so real quick way to do that down here in our inspector. If we need to uh, change certain portions of it, we can expand that by right clicking up in the hierarchy and clicking expand. And now it's going to break this into the floor, downstage. Uh, and downstage is, is critical here. So if with our camera, if we look at it from the front, we'll be looking from downstage towards upstage. So that's why those dimensions uh, or those delineations are important. Also, it's important to have those in the correct place so that the one-way mirror functions correctly. If we had our downstage and upstage swapped, we'd have a solid wall with an invisible wall behind it. Um, so there's stage left, stage right, there's upstage at the back, and downstage again. Let me rotate my view a little here. So if, for example, we need to modify this uh, a little bit, we can, you know, change each piece here. I'm actually gonna grab the upstage so we can see it. So we're not looking at an invisible wall. Um, I can change that, that size here in the inspector. I can go to my scale tool and scale it right there in the model as well. Make it taller. Uh, I can't really make it deeper. Uh, these walls are, have special handling to, you know, they're, they're only two dimensional. So if I use my white node here, I can scale the height and width together. So if, for example, I need to add a couple of doors into this venue, what I might do is, you know, let's get our height back to, back to 30, where it was. Um, our scale, there we go. Um, what I might do is I could shrink this wall a little bit here, and then I can come over and now I have to remember where doors are. I think they're in architecture. There we go. And I'm going to bring a door in, and I want to move that. And I could place place a door here, and grab another one, and place a door here. And these may or may not be important in your venue. So as we're going through today, again, keep in mind if you're not if your lights in your show aren't interacting with these doors, it may not be worth the time to put these in. Um, you may be fine with a solid wall, even though there's some architecture there. If you have a staircase in the corner that's never being lit, you don't need to bother putting it in. If you have performers on that staircase, then you you know it could be very helpful to put that in there. That's going to depend on what what you need. For your for your programming. Uh, so in order to line these up a little better, I'm going to switch into uh, our orthographic mode. Grab our camera, switch to ortho, and I want to look down here. And I'm going to zoom to selection to find our door there. And I'm just going to line these up. Oh, I'm still on scale. That is my problem. There we go. So that door might be a little different size. So that'll be fun. And um, we'll come over here and do the same thing. All right, and then we can switch back to orthographic mode, zoom to selection again. And now our doors are lined up a little bit better. And now I want to scale this wall out to match those doors. And just move it a little bit. Okay. And now, in order to fill in these gaps above the doors, uh, I could put in two, two wall pieces here. 
Uh, but what I'm going to do just to save a little time and effort is I'm actually going to shrink this wall down to the height of the doors. And then I'm going to add a single piece over the top here. So because that is an upstage wall, which I can tell from my hierarchy here, I'm going to come over to my library and all the way at the bottom. So if I, if I collapse, uh, just in my stock architecture here, uh, down here at the bottom, below all the folders, we have ceiling, floor, ground, uh, and the different walls. So I'm going to grab an upstage wall and bring that in. And you'll see it's solid on this side. And if I spin around, all of those pieces are now see-through on that side. So I'm going to work with it from the solid side because that's a little easier. Uh, so what we're going to do is move that back. I'll get it close here and then we'll check it in our orthographic mode. And I'm gonna scale that down. And it does uh, default to basically sticking to the floor, which is typically helpful. In this case, we want it off the floor. There, and we can scale a little more. There we go. And then depending on how accurate you know, we wanna be, we can jump back into our orthographic mode. and check those dimensions. So if we want to look at it from the front, there we go. Looks a little wide. Slide that over the top there. And then I want to check it from the side to make sure front to back we're good. Yeah, so we're just a little too far. Let me zoom in so you all can see that. I want to be right over the door. And it looks like our height is just a little too tall. There we go. So now if we go back to perspective view and zoom to selection, and now we've got our back wall with a couple doors in it. And if we spin around here, we can see right through. So the doors will stay there, of course, because um, they are solid. They don't have that spatial handling. Um, but we can still see through our venue. And then to kind of show how this works with lights, um, these are probably the only lights we're going to drop in today. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just put a few lights on the floor and point them. So let's here, I'm going to say done and accept the changes to save that. And I'm just split screen so everybody can see patch at the same time. And I'm just going to add four pars on the floor real quick here. And I'm going to patch those as color choice pars. And I'm going to go pretty quickly through this part since uh, we've, we've done all this in previous videos. Uh, but if if you have questions, feel free to to type those in the Q and A. And I need to give give those some position. And we'll say they're at negative five. I'm going to do this as a range, um, if you'll remember. And I'll put them a foot off the ground just so we can see them easily. There we go. There's our pars. And let's zoom in over here a bit so you can see. And then, whoops, and then to patch them, or to, to focus them, we will need to be in a patch screen. Oh, they're all upside down. That's my problem. Let's rotate those so they are pointing up. That will be easier. All right, so this guy, I'm going to point at the door. The outside ones, I'm going to point at the doors. And then the inside ones, I'm going to point at the corners. There we go. And then I'll select all of them just so we can see. Okay, so we've got some, some lights there. Alrighty, so let's go back to our model. 
And I'm going to turn those on in live here. Now they're on. Um, and then the, the last thing I want to do here before we take a look at this is I want to add a ceiling on this venue. So I'm going to go back to my editor. And again, outside of the folders down at the bottom, uh, we have a ceiling. Um, it's sort of like switching upstage and downstage. I, I could put a floor up in the air, but the, the one-way mirror functionality will be reversed from what we probably want. So I want to make sure I put a ceiling in there. And I know that my room, I believe, is 60 by 60. So I'm going to make my ceiling be 60 by 60. There we go. And I'm going to move it right down. It's kind of hard to see because we're looking at it through the top. So you can see if I look at it through the bottom, I've got that same functionality as the, the walls. Once I come up to the top, I can see right through it. And then if it's not selected, you can't even really tell it's there. So with these lights on, and we'll go into just into live here. Um, I'm also going to turn down my ambient light a little bit so you can see better. Um, so with these on, once I spin around, so you can see they're hitting the walls, they're hitting the doors, uh, they're hitting the ceiling a little bit from the top corners. But once I spin around in my venue, you'll see that we can still see the beams of light hitting the, the ceiling here and the walls and around the doors, but we don't have that wall in our way. Let's turn up their brightness too. Oh, they are, okay. Um, there we go, that helps. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show is if we didn't have a wall there at all, or if we open these doors, uh, for example, it's a little too bright, I'll put that at 75. So I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna hide these doors right now. Uh, we could attach these to scenic object channels and turn them off, make them invisible, which we've discussed in a previous video as well, if you needed to cue this in. Um, for today, I'm just gonna hide them in the, in the editor. And you can see what that does is now the beams of light go through those doors. So this might be a little clearer if we look at it from the other side. There we go. So that now the doors aren't there effectively. And so now the beams of light are continuing through the doors. It's just those that hit the doors. The ones that hit the, the, the walls and the ceiling still stop at those locations. So just some conventions with the kind of the one-way mirror style of walls here. Um, again, this works on floors, ceilings, and all the, and all the walls. Uh, Nick, do we have any questions? Or I can I can keep going. If there's okay. any, this might be a good point to. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a, a good point. I think um, uh, Tony just wanted a quick reminder on um, world X Y Z values versus the other values in your. Oh sure. Your... Hey, let me turn my ambient light up back up a little bit, so we can see a little better. Yeah, so the venue, so after I exploded it, um, we have more, uh, we're gonna use our world versus our position. So all of the, oh, the other thing I should do, um, I'll, actually I'll explain this and then I'll do this. So I, I have not yet associated my new wall or my new ceiling with the venue. So I need I need to do that to, to really make it work correctly. So let's look at some of the ones that are associated right now. So the, the black box itself, is at zero 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 uh, world and position, and those will all be the same because it's it's the top level object in the in the tree. The floor, uh, its world position. It, here, let's, the floor is not a good example. Let's look at the downstage wall. So the the downstage wall is uh, its position is relative to. Uh, what it is associated with. So it's relative to the, the black box, relative to that, the origin of that. So that is, you know, 49 feet downstage. Um, but its world view or its world position is 30 feet. So the ceiling, again, the ceiling is not yet associated uh, with anything. So it, 
world and positioning be the same. If I drag that onto our black box here, that work. Um, you can see its position is now shifted a little bit. Um, the other one I don't know if we've talked about before is bounds here. It's not editable, but it is some good information. So that is basically the, the entire footprint of that object, like how much space is it taking up? And it's 60 by 60. Um, the reason, and Nick, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe the reason the size here is off is because of the, the scaling. So when we brought that in, because um, so we can see our bounds are 60 by 60, but in our size, it looks like it's more than that. Um, and it has to do with the, the scale of that. Um, if we change our scale back to one, that's going to be back to the size it started at. Um, but we'll need our, if we change our size back to 60. Hmm, I'm not sure why it behaves like that. Like I know that I want the bounds to be 60. Um, which before I associated it with the the ceiling, like if I drag it out of there, now it's you know on its own, and I can set these. Yeah, I think that might be coming um, by the the black box. So the it's scale it's, like the size of the black box. Yeah, correct. So so like anything, uh, I, I like to call these things children and parents because um, a lot of the children objects will inherit the properties of the parent, right? So um, so if you're doing something uh, like scale. Um, that's going to also scale down um, any child object, right? Um, so a way to kind of think about this is um, when you're dealing with children and parents, um, you know, world versus uh, uh, position, as Rob said, it's sort of relative to its parent versus relative to the actual origin of the space. Um, and scale is, you know, a scale of one, one, one is the size of the object when we bring it in, right? So if I've got a, a 10 foot, a 10 foot cube, um, and I bring it in, that's going to be 10 feet by 10 feet in real space. And this might build on to Phil's question who asks about sort of like uh, absolute scale, like a CAD drawing. We're drafting in, in, in real space here, right? These measurements are, you know, if it's, it's 10 feet wide, there's no scale applied to that. So what you'll see is when you adjust uh, the measurement of an object, your scale is going to auto adjust to, I hope that makes sense. Um, you know, those things are, are sort of inextricably tied together. Um, whenever we bring in an object, it's going to be a scale of one, 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 regardless of its uh, measurement. And then as you adjust measurement, it will adjust the scale of it. So the other thing I could do is, yeah, I hope, I hope that answered everyone's question. Uh, I'm going to bring in my door. I'm going to nest everything under my, my black box that we've added. So the doors, the walls, the ceiling. Uh, and then I can right click on the black box and say collapse. And now it's all a single object again. And now I can move, my lights don't move, of course, but I can move this. So the doors are moving with it. The ceiling I added is moving with it. And I can also scale all of that together as well. So now I can make everything bigger or smaller in relationship to, to each other. It's also a little bit easier to <clears throat> just to, to manage so you're not clicking on, on different portions of it once, once your venue is built. Um, the other thing you may want to do uh, once a venue is built is lock it. Um, so this lock icon, it basically just prevents you from selecting it by clicking so I can select my lights. But if, you know, those are pretty small because I'm zoomed out, if I misclick, I'm not going to accidentally select the venue. So once, you know, and that, that's something you would do at the, at the very end once you're you're done um, building it. And then to, to unlock it, you just need to select it in the hierarchy, and I can unlock it there. So I want to make my doors visible, though. There we go. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Jeff asks, and uh, you may cover this, but Jeff asks about uh, a raised stage that has a round front. 
um, and and steps, right? So sort of a you know rounded step thing, yeah. um, but also uh, other rounded architecture like soffits and things like that. Sure. sure. Yeah, we'll get into uh, a couple of our stock venues have some of those built in. So those might be close enough for what you need. Uh, and then we'll look at some other objects that we could add in top of those um, for steps and ramps and things like that. So yes, we, we will get there. Very good. Yeah, and I, I think that it's, you know- Yeah, we'll we're starting very simple with the box. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think we'll say this uh, kind of throughout, but um, you know, these are tools that will get you, as Rob said at the beginning, kind of close enough you know, to get representational. Um, if you need a lot of detail, at a certain point, you're going to have to pop over to a CAD program. Um, you know, we, we give you some really basic tools to get started. Um, but, uh, but if you're needing to build all sorts of strange shapes at odd angles and stuff, um, use drafting software to build that and then bring it in. And the other thing, correct me if I'm uh, saying this wrong, but um, all of these stock objects are designed for high performance in the in the software, so they have you know, even even the rounded objects have as as few triangles as possible. And what that lets us do is it it just lets the software render faster and, and perform better. So all of the all of the stock objects have taken that into account. You know, we've uh, kind of leaned towards better performance over better graphics on all of those. And once you start bringing in things from a CAD program. You, you may be tipping the scale towards better graphics, but slower performance. And that's that's going to depend on your hardware, of course, as well. But it's worth mentioning that the stock objects are kind of optimized for performance. Um, a Anything quick else? Question, really quick. Yeah, yeah. Tony, uh, Tony mentioned that he's noticed that when an object is selected and you lock it um, in the inspector, uh, you can't make changes actually in the inspector, but that the move arrows in the drawing area Still work. Um, I think that's intentional, Tony. And yeah, that's uh, you can, with it selected through the hierarchy, you can still move it around, um, but you have to unlock it to make any changes in the inspector. Um, so, so exactly. So you have to. You can't select it in the model space. You have to select it in the hierarchy. But once you have it selected, you can use all of the tools that are down the menu bar. Yep. Correct. So, a quick way to just let you move stuff without having to unlock it again. Cool. And you'll see the even though the in the inspector the numbers are grayed out, they are updating as I move it with that tool. For me, it's more about not accidentally selecting it. Um, if you know, if I need to change it here, I can always unlock it. Yeah, and I think you know whether you're importing or building this stuff natively, I think that is a useful thing. Period. If you if you set something. Um, that is going to remain static, like a venue, like architecture. Um, locking it is a great way to make sure you're not accidentally interacting with it. You can deal with other detailed stuff like scenery a little bit more easily. So uh, that's the questions that we have for right now. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to attempt to just slide this one out of the way. And, oh, I did unlock it, okay. Um, see if I can grab everything. Just in case we want to come back to it. Bye, venue. Now, one of my doors moved. Or my doors moved. Oh, because they weren't locked. That's okay. Uh, so, in case we want to go back to that one, we can. Uh, but I'm just, I'll, everything we're building today, I'm going to build on the origin um, because that's how I would recommend doing it, first of all. And it's just much easier to deal with um, if you get your origin correct from the get go. Um, so, I'm going to look, take a quick look at some of these other stock venues. And then um, we're going to spend some time with the proscenium, but I just want to show you all of them. Um, so the black box small, like I said already, is exactly the same as the large one, other than it is smaller. So there's that one, and I'm going to go ahead and delete that one out of there. Uh, we have an in the round. So this is, you know, there's a circle. I can zoom in here, and we can scale this one just like uh, anything else. So I can. You can have it in the in the oval kind of space here, and then we can you know make them we can get some depth, and then don't forget about our snap to the ground plane button. So I can snap that. So that is going to snap the bottom of it. Um, if I was doing this, I would have the the top of it at zero. 
you know, my position, my Z position is zero. That way I know anything, any objects that I place on top of there, their height is going to be relative to zero um, instead of relative to two feet or you know, wherever I wherever I put it. So there's that venue. I delete that one. We have an in in the round square, which I guess is technically correct. A little bit of an oxymoron, but that will behave the same way. We can stretch it. We can uh, change its height. Delete that one. I'm going to skip proscenium and come right back to it. Um, thrust. So this one does have some some steps. So for that question, you know, this portion here um, may may work for you. So let's let's take a quick look at this one. Let's Helps if I use the right keys. So this one, if I right click and expand, we get the, the thrust stage, which cuts off right at the proscenium, which might be helpful. So if I break that away or delete it, now I have a, a true proscenium. You'll see in our proscenium one, it's the, the stage actually extends past the proscenium. So maybe you don't need a thrust, but maybe you, you need no apron at all. So I would start with this venue and just get rid of that, that thrust portion of it. Um, so this one, uh, I cannot break this down anymore. Uh, so, you know, we have basically a top and, and a single step down. But what I can do is uh, shrink that way down, kind of make a little stair unit like that. Maybe my apron looks something like that, um, if that's useful for you. And then the proscenium is going to behave just like the um, the one we'll look at in just a moment, so I won't spend too much time on this one. I think for, for additional stairs, you could also potentially see those. That might, that might work if you needed additional steps. To, to do what? Uh, to stack those with different sizes oh, sure. so that you can make uh, more steps. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, so I just did a Control-C and Control-V so we can do this and scale that down a little and then raise it up. And I haven't done this before, so it's not going to be perfect, but yeah, that's a little, little lumpy. It looks like that if I were to build steps, it would look very much like that. So this is very accurate to my carpentry skills. Um, right. So let's go ahead and delete. Oh, not that one, thrust stage. And then we'll be left with a pair of steps that we didn't associate. So we'll delete that as well. And then our, our traverse stage. So we use this one in some of our using augmented series. Um, it's kind of our runway idea. So this is basically two prosceniums with uh, a long stage in between. And if you expand, that in the hierarchy, that is what you will see. So we have the, the stage itself, which is just the, the center runway. And then we have we, we call it downstage on the side because that's the, the front of the building. But that is split into the psych, which is basically just the back wall. And then the proscenium arch, which is split into a header and two legs here. And we're going to look at all this in our proscenium next. And then we have the upstage side. So again, much like the thrust stage, you know, I could take the the arch here and here I'll take its upstage one. I could take the arch and slide it. Oops, and this one is built incorrectly, so I will have to find the right. There we go. We could slide the arch right there and then get rid of the the stage if we needed to. And now we have a, a very basic proscenium right there. Uh, okay, so I'm going to delete this one and now we'll bring in the proscenium and we're going to spend a little bit of time with this one. So like I said, this one, the stage extends past the, the proscenium itself a little bit um, and it has a nice little curved apron, so that may be, be helpful. So we're not able to edit the, the curve in here um, yeah, with our stock model, but we can add some other objects if we if we need to. <clears throat> so with this one, uh, I'm going to attempt, and I showed this at the beginning, I'm going to 
uh, basically use this as a as a template as a as a model. Um, this is this is a real venue. Uh, we're going to just use these dimensions today, so we're not just making them up as we go. And we'll see how how close we can get. Uh, I also have a printed copy of that right in front of me, so I'm not going to keep referring back to that. But if you guys have questions or want to look at it, I'll try and pull it up again at the end, um, so we can see how how good I did. Um, okay, so I'm going to start by expanding that and see what pieces we have. So we have the stage, which does include our our front lip here. We have the psych or back wall. And then we have the proscenium arch, which consists of a stage right leg, a header, and a stage left leg. So I know that this, uh, the stage house here, so not the proscenium width, but the width of the entire deck is 107 feet by about 50 feet. And I'm going to leave the, the height alone for today. So that is our uh, total footprint. And then I know that the the grid in this venue is actually about 65 feet high. We're not going to make it that high for today, um, but I'll just grab all of our um, our psych and our proscenium arch, and we're going to make those all be 35 feet high for today. Uh, yep, I knew that was going to happen. The our header does not want to be 35 feet tall. That wants to be. Uh, five feet tall. There we go. That's better. Um, okay. And then, so the width, the opening of our proscenium is 56 foot eight. So that's how we're going to start with our header here in this case. So I'm going to make that be 56.8. And now we know that these, uh, our legs here need to move to the outside. And I just want those to extend all the way to the to the end. So I'm going to start by doing this with, you know, eyeball, and then we'll we'll fix it, get a little more precise. Yeah, that's a little too wide there. There we go. That's pretty close. And that looks like 24 foot 10. Um, so I did some math, and if I take the 107 and I subtract my 57 foot 8. To check my notes. Uh, that is 25 foot 2 inches. So we're at 24.10. So we were close. So 25.2 is how wide those should be. Both the same. And the reason I did 35 feet as the height, uh, let's position this one too. And we can come and check that with our orthographic in just a moment. Um, the reason I picked 35 feet as their height is my proscenium opening is 30 feet tall. So that's, you know, my, my proscenium opening is obviously an important uh, dimension for lighting. If these aren't exactly correct out here, probably doesn't matter. Uh, but I want my, obviously, my opening to be centered and the correct size. So the, the reason I picked 35 feet was I know my opening is 30 feet. And my header is, I made that be five feet tall. Um, in, in this venue, in reality, this entire uh, span across the top goes up another like 20 feet or so. Um, for the purposes of this model, though, that's really just going to be in my way of when I'm trying to look at things. I'm never going to point lights up there. So I've, I've just made the decision to kind of chop that off just for, for ease of, of my use. Um, I got pretty close. So I'm going to set that to uh, 35 right there. And my walls are 35 high, so that should be a nice straight line across the top there. And let's go ahead and check our, uh, our placement of the walls to see how we did on that. So let's go to camera, and we'll go to orthographic and look at it from the front. And I'm going to zoom to my header. And actually, for this moment, I'm going to hide the psych so I can see a little better. Just get that out of the way. And that looks pretty good. Um, let's zoom to where I can see my arrow here. Pretty good. My math said 
I had 41 foot one. Let's see. Um, so obviously I'm using this to visually line up, um, but math is also your friend. Um, so we're gonna say negative 41.1. And I think my math was off because I'm hanging off the edge just a tiny bit. But again, do I have a gap here? I do. So my math was off. Let's try just 41. I bet I did the inch the wrong way. So we're gonna do negative 40.11. There we go. That looks that looks good. And then over here, that'll just be the opposite. So it'll be 40, 40 foot, 11 inches. Okay, so we can turn our psych uh, back on. Don't forget to do that. And let's go ahead and go back to our perspective view. And let's grab our psych and zoom to selection. Okay, so obviously we need to make our psych a little bit bigger now. So this is going to be 107 feet wide. Uh, the venue psych is not 107 feet wide, uh, but the back wall is because it matches the floor. So we're gonna do that. And then our, uh, our Y dimension, we can line that up over here. For today, I'm going to say that is good. Um, we could go back into orthographic, of course. Um, but we're going to say that's good for today. So that is uh, that is our venue. If we, we tip up here, kind of look at it like that. If we switch back to um, my magic sheet, you can see we've got an apron. Um, this venue actually does have some some walkways over here. If it didn't, um, you know, go back to our model. How critical, you know, if these don't need to be here, I could possibly move the proscenium arch downstage and adjust the, the depth of the stage accordingly um, and just have that, that apron here. Um, so just to kind of give some ideas of, you know, again, our representational model. So if, if I did that, Maybe the proscenium in reality curved to here and didn't continue on past. Can you live with that using, you know, just using the tools that are in here? Maybe, maybe it's fine. Maybe you can't. Um, again, if if that level of accuracy is really needed for your venue, you may have to go to to a CAD program to to bring in to to get that level of of specificity. So I'm going to slide that back. Uh, actually, it's just change my Y to zero, and it will go right back where it was. Um, okay, so where'd my header go? Oh, what happened there? Put our position back at 35. Okay. Um, great. So the next thing I want to do here, checking my notes. Um, so I want to add a couple of of sidewalls. So our our stock venue didn't didn't include any sidewalls. So I do want to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to do these uh, two different ways. So I'm going to start with our stage left wall, and I'm going to use our wall stage left object, and I'm going to bring that in and slide that over here. And I know that its size is 35 feet to match everything else. And its Y dimension should be about 40 feet. It's a little big. Um, and then we'll need to position it here. And because we use that stage left wall, when I'm looking at it, here, let's fix that scale. Uh, when I'm looking at it from this end, it's you know it's invisible, just like our black box. But when I spin around, I've got a solid wall there, and I can I can hit point lights at it. Uh, most of the time, you're you know you're you're not pointing lights at the wall, or if you're doing a dance show with booms, yes, you're pointing them at that wall, but you don't really care what they look like on the wall because your audience can't see that. So maybe adding this wall isn't worth it. Uh, 
for your venue. Again, just spend time on what is important to helping you program. So for the other wall, just to show the difference, um, instead of using a, a wall object, I'm going to do this with a cube, just to show you a different uh, method of doing this. So if I go to objects, and nope, just kidding, uh, shapes, and then 3D and cube, and we'll, uh, toward the end today, we'll look at all these objects, uh, all these 3D objects, but for right now, I'm just going to grab the standard cube here and drag that over here a bit, and I'm going to make its size be 35 feet tall. And how wide was our wall? It ended up being about 35 foot 10. So we'll do that here. And then for my X dimension, I'm going to make that be uh, six inches thick. And Y. Oh, this this is the same issue we had on the other one. So our our scaling is uh, affecting our dimensions here uh, because the cube is not uh, nested within the, the proscenium. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I'm going to drop it into make it a child of the proscenium, and I'll do the same thing with our other wall while I'm at it here. All right. So now the Uh, I need to change our, so our world size should be 35 by, oh, that's position. All right, so I'm going to do this manually and scale that. A little big there. And just a little too tall. Here we go. All right. So and then we need to line it up over here on the correct side of the stage. That would be six feet thick, I think. I think that's our problem. There we go. Okay. Oh, and now we're too tall. Thank you for bearing with me. So now that I've used a cube to kind of make a, a, a solid, you know, sheet of concrete or, or sheet metal or something, whatever our building's made out of. Um, so now this wall is going to be solid. It's not going to have the one-way mirror properties that our other wall does. I can still shine lights on it in the exact same manner, but I can't. Uh, it's, it's always going to be solid when I look at it from this side. So just depending on, on what you're looking for, maybe you want it to be there all the time, uh, maybe you don't in a, in a proscenium kind of situation here. Um, I will point out that our, oops, our psych, our back wall is solid all the time, as is our proscenium arch. You know, it doesn't disappear when we, when we look at it. You could build one with those wall objects, you know, turn these into downstage wall objects if you wanted that functionality. Just depends on how you want to work in your in your venue. And then once all of this is complete, um, I believe I've nested everything. Yep. So I want to uh, collapse that here. So it just becomes one object again. So now I can you know, move it all together if, if I need to. Um, I, I don't want to. I want to keep my origin at all the zeros here. Uh, and I know we've talked about this before, but I think it's really important, especially in a proscenium type of venue um, where your your plaster line, your center line, and your deck height are all zero. So 
but then it makes math really easy once you start dropping in other objects, uh, which we're going to do next. So uh, why don't we pause for a couple questions if we have any, Nick, and then I'm going to get into adding some, some curtains and some pipes. Yeah, perfect. Um, so uh, uh, Jeff brought up a question of just um, uh, talking about uh, reviewing sort of object base points. Um, he asked if if the, each object and fixtures have a different uh, zero position, which, which we call a base point. Do you just want to go through kind of what base points are and yeah, uh, and kind of here? Let me yeah. So I'll bring in another object just so we have something else to to look at. So I've got a blue cube here, and this object's base point is in the x y center. Here, let me get out of the proscenium so you can see what we're doing. Here, let's do this. One over here, and I'm going to look at it in orthographic, actually, from the front. Zoom to selection. There we go. So I'm looking at this cube dead on from the front, uh, and you can see that its base point is in the very center as far as vertically and horizontally. And if I look at it from the side, you can see it's in the center from front to back as well. Or, Proceedings in the way there, but um, so we do not allow you currently to modify the base point of an object. So this is uh, it's, a, it's an important it's just important to realize where they are. So if I say snap snap to ground, it is putting the bottom of the object at the zero z position. But you'll see that its height and this is height of the base point is one foot seven inches and change, which tells me that this object is about three foot two inches uh, tall. So when we get into pipe in just a second, you'll see that the base point is on the end of the object uh, and not the center. So we just have to be aware of that and, and take that into account as we're positioning things. Um, if you're bringing in objects from other programs, you can, uh, depending on what program you're using, uh, many CAD programs allow you to define the base point of an object, but that will need to be done on the on the CAD side. And then uh, when you bring it in, we can, um, there's a couple options when you import objects of how to handle that base point. So we can actually move it at that time. So you can keep it where it was. We can put it in the center of the object, the bottom, the top. Uh, what's the fourth option? Just one more. Uh, by model, which means we use the model's origin, so it's the relationship of the object to the zero right. zero origin. Um, of the augmented model, yeah. Yep. Very good. Great. Um, Matthew asks, uh, uh, first, he, he likes how easy it is uh, to, to build, um, but the theater has some small oddities. Um, the, the question is, can you export this model so you can go into CAD and edit it? Um, I, I don't think we can. Can we, Nick? Yeah, um, so so uh, we, we don't do exports right now, so um, you can't export the model. So you would, uh, if you see that some of those things are going to be difficult to do in here, um, either draft just those components in CAD and bring them in. Uh, or go ahead and uh, start in CAD if you have access to that. Yep. Um, Jeff is asking uh, with uh, copy paste, which is Control C and Control V. Um, uh, when objects are copied and pasted, do they hold all the same properties and can just be moved, like same walls, things like that? Uh, they they do hold all the same properties. I will say, let me make sure this is correct before I say it out loud. Um, so if I copy my psych, for example. Yeah, so you'll notice, uh, so I just copy and pasted the psych. Uh, so now I have two of them. So first of all, it, when you paste it, it goes exactly on the um, same, same position. So it, you might not think it worked because it's they're literally on top of each other. Um, but then you just have to move it and you can see it. Uh, but I will point out, uh, so my proscenium noticed that it in my hierarchy, it put it directly in the hierarchy. It is not nested. So I started with the, the nested psych and it placed it outside of that, outside of the proscenium. So because of the scaling we were looking at earlier, some of the numbers may appear to change because we're not, we're no longer referencing that, uh, that parent object. 
Yeah, but one of the things the software tries to do is as you're moving in and out of parent objects, so as you uh, copy and paste something, um, uh, or as you drag things in and out of, um, you know, from being nested under a, a parent, um, the the software preserves the actual real world size of that. So you'll see some numbers jump as you go in and out of of those objects because we're trying to make sure that the the real world shape and space of that thing stays the same, even if, for example, like we ran into earlier, like the black box was scaling down um, some of the objects. When we transverse that, we try and, and preserve that stuff. So your numbers will shift, but your objects should stay uh, in the same space. Um, so, uh, and, and Seth mentioned that uh, Control D is duplicate, which is good to know as well. So instead of Control C, Control V, you can just hit Control D, that will duplicate that object. Um, and away you go. Thank you, Seth. Thanks, Seth. Thanks. Anything else? Uh, that's all the questions we have for now, so we can Perfect. move right along. I'm going to delete all these extra psychs. Uh, okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is, so now that the, the room is built, uh, I've already, you know, I've, here, let me recollapse this. So once the, the room is built, and what that means might be different, you know, between people, uh, but for me, it's, it's what we've done right here. It's the walls, the proscenium, the floor. If there was a ceiling, I'd probably include that. Um, and I'm going to start dropping in some um, some pipe and some op goods. Uh, to me, those are different objects from the room. Maybe you want to, you would choose to nest those into your proscenium. Um, it's again, just think about how you want things to interact with each other. So for this part, I'm going to. Uh, do this in orthographic mode from the top or looking down. And I'm going to zoom to proscenium. Just kind of looking in a ground plan mode here. So I'm going to add in some some pipes. So I'm going to add in the electrics, and I've actually got the line schedule from this venue right here. Um, so pipes are under our truss section. And again, at, at the end of this, we'll kind of do, do a quick drive by all the all the folders here for anything we've missed. Um, so there's a few different truss objects, and then there's a single pipe object. So I'm going to bring that in and zoom to that here. So you see that the base point is over here on the the stage, our stage right side of it. So right now this is a uh, the pipe is three foot three inches. Uh, long, which is probably 10 meters, I'm guessing. Um, and then I have, it does have a Y and a Z dimension, which I'm not going to, to change. I don't need a tall, skinny pipe. I've never seen one of those. Um, but I do want to change my X dimension. So I know that the pipes in this venue are 75 feet wide. So I'm going to put in 75. And if I now zoom to my object, I can see that because our base point, again, back to base point, it's put it 75 feet uh, that, you know, off center. So to, to counteract that, I'm going to change its X position to be negative uh, 37 and a half. And that will put it uh, right on my, my center line. Uh, this is also placing it at the plaster line because that is our Y. Uh, right now it has a Y position of zero, which Again, if, if we match that to our plaster line, this kind of thing becomes really easy. So if I check my line set schedule over here, I know that my first electric is at five foot upstage. So I can put in five foot dimension there. And I'm going to name this first electric. And if I take Seth, Seth's advice and control D, it's going to make another one. And I'm just going to label that. Second, and I'm actually I'm going to go ahead and do all four of these right here. So I'm just hitting Control D to to duplicate those. Third and fourth, and now I can uh, check my line set schedule again. So the second electric is 13 feet, so I'll change my Y to 13. Third electric is 21. 
and the fourth electric is 29. So now I'm going to select all of them just so that we can see them a little bit better. So now I've got my my pipes here. Uh, they all are all still sitting on the ground right now. So obviously our Z is going to be based on the trim of each show. Um, so for the moment, I'll just put in 25 feet for those. And now if we switch back to our orthographic view, we see we've got they're a little hard to see. They're all, everything's gray. Um, here, I'll select them again. We've got our pipes in our in our venue. So again, I would you could nest these in your proscenium if they were never going to move. If you had a dead hung grid, maybe you'd want those on there. Um, remember, we can also associate fixtures channels with those those positions, so we can move an entire electric up and down, uh, and the fixtures will will follow. So that's that's pretty useful since that's how things really work. Um, so the the last thing I want to do here is I'm going to add some some curtains. So we have a drape folder, and we've got a couple different colors. I'm going to go with good old black, and we get this like miniature little uh, piece of soft goods here. And again, the the base point is on the bottom, but on one end. So the size of these, uh, these are going to be, we'll say, 18 feet wide. Oops, that was position. Let's make the size be 18 feet. There we go. And they are 30 feet tall. Or you can do a 30 foot wide dimension. 30 feet tall. Uh, we can, you can, I mean, that was kind of silly, but you can get a little bit of texture or less texture with your Y dimension on these. Um, I grab my, you know, you can have them be real flat or a little, little bit of fullness, so to speak. We'll say six inches here for these. And then if we look at this, let's go back to our uh, orthographic and look down again. Let's go front and then down. There we go. And again, this is uh, going to be based on um, that base point, which is on the on the end here. So we're going to say that's about 28 feet uh, there. And I can duplicate that. And I'm going to move this one to the other side of the stage. And let's take a look at this in perspective here. The, the zoom to selection might get out of jail free anytime my camera goes way off the reservation there. Um, so if I slide this, so there's my proscenium. So I want it to be upstage of my proscenium. Let's see, our first, uh, on this line set schedule, our first uh, batten with the legs is three foot 10. So we'll put a Y of three foot 10. And it looks like we're sticking to the wall a little. Or well, I because I move the walls up. We'll just adjust that a little bit. So it's one. There we go. Oh, I must have mistyped. Okay. Three foot ten works well. So we'll do three foot ten on the other side. And then if we grab this, if we look at this from the front again. Live, you know, we want just a little bit of curtain there. That looks good. And I'm actually going to make these taller so they go above our proscenium. So let's change these to uh, 35 feet. So I think I'm, yeah, we'll do 35. There we go. Uh, and then what I can do is uh, we could go back into uh, ortho if we wanted to. Oh, did I put them on the same? Yep, sure did. There we go. Uh, so I can grab the pair, and I can duplicate those. 
and now I can slide those up to the next step, which is nine feet. So we'll put a Y of nine. I can duplicate them again. That set is 15 foot eight. Duplicate them again, and that set is 23 foot eight. And I could, of course, associate these with some pipes. We didn't put pipes in for our curtains. Uh, for, you know, if, if I'm in a venue where they never move, those pipes probably aren't going to be very useful to me unless I'm also hanging lights on them or, or other scenery, things like that. Um, so again, kind of whatever works best for your, for your workflow. So we've got a nice little proscenium here. I could also, uh, make a folder called soft goods and put all these curtains in there so I could deal with them all together if I wanted to. Um, I could do each pair, which is probably what I would do, uh, actually. So I'd have my, you know, my first legs one, legs two, legs three, legs four, each as a folder so I could move those all in, in tandem together. Um, so that is our basic proscenium venue. I'm going to check my notes one more time, make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, yeah, so uh, why don't we take a break for questions if we have any, and then I want to go over uh, just a couple things with shapes, and that's that's what I got for today. Very good. Yeah, I'll I'll say I think you said it, uh, Rob, but I'll say it again just to hit it home. Um, you know the the curtains and the pipes and things that are in augmented um, are are generated in our own software, so. Um, there are fewer uh, triangles to have to calculate when we're rendering light reflecting off of things. Um, so if you're looking at bringing in a curtain from uh, a Vectorworks drawing versus drawing it in here, um, the, the curtain object in here is always going to be a little bit easier on your resources. Um, same with pipe, same with truss. Um, the indicator is any of the objects that have that little left and right arrow as their icon. Um, the fancy word for that is called a procedural object. It, it means that augmented is rendering and creating it uh, within itself, so it's a little bit easier on the engine. Um, so, so I just wanted to point that out again. Those, those procedural objects can save you um, rather than bringing them in from a CAD program. Um, uh, I'm going to maybe put you on the spot. I know how I would handle it, Rob, but um, uh, Jeff is asking uh, his venue has uh, a couple of angled pipes, and so he has the X, Y, Z location of each end of these angled pipes, and, and mm -hmm. presumably the length of the pipe. Um, how would you go about setting those um, in in the space in augmented? If you, well, on the spot, off the top of my head, uh, what I might do is drop in some objects at those positions, those known positions, and then add a pipe and rotate it uh, to match so that each end lands on those positions. So I could just use cubes or something, uh, you know, arbitrary to, to set those positions. And then, um, again, here we can, let's look at angling a pipe. So we have, that's, most of the time you, you know, they're very cross, but not always. So if we go to our rotate tools, you know, we can rotate this pipe wherever we want to. So I could drop a cube, uh, at each end. And, and go in between. That's that's my off the cuff answer. What is that? Did you have a different solution? No, that was exactly what I would do. I would drop in uh, nodes or other objects, um, just rotate and get it to line up where I wanted it to, and then delete those reference objects. Um, or, or if they're needed to, hold them in and put them in a folder that I could turn off. So exact same solution. So great mind. And you, can, you much. if you if you had you know a, a pipe that was higher, like a triangle in the center. You could have it would be two pipe objects that met there. You know, I can't I can't take this pipe object and bend it, but I could yeah. uh, put two together and then and then group them. Yeah, and if you got some some complicated piping or something that is like a really precise, you know, I'm thinking of like a balcony front edge, right? That's like a really large precise piece of yeah. bent metal or something. Um, that's a perfect application to go into a CAD program. Um, you know, the amount of time that you will fuss with getting something like that right in here um, versus just drawing it in the in a full CAD suite. Um, 
you know, I would also, uh, for the sake of ease, let's say I'm drawing that that balcony uh, balcony rail pipe. Um, I would draft it um, in relation to my uh, my zero zero zero, right? My origin, so that when I dropped it into this model, I would keep the import as model, and it would snap to the right place in X Y Z space, and then I wouldn't even have to fuss with that stuff. Um, so keep that in mind. Cool. And these, all of these things are hopefully, you know, if, if you're in a situation where you're always in the same venue or in the same few venues day in and day out, you spend some time getting it right once and then you've got it forever. Um, if you're on a tour, obviously that's a different situation. Um, maybe you can butter up your, your, uh, your house guys on each stop and see if they can build those things for you. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, da, 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 da. Um, I'm, we, we have some other questions coming in. Uh, we, we, Rob's got one more section, and then we'll get some, to some of the non um, uh, uh, sort of off-topic questions we'll, we'll get to. Sure. Um, sure. So I'm just scanning through to make sure um, we have some of these. Um, uh, Don is asking about uh, having the Revit as built file for a new venue. Can you import that into augmented? Yeah, so just check the manual for what uh, objects, uh, what file formats are supported. Um, but uh, we did cover all that stuff in our um, uh, importing objects a couple sessions ago that Rob did. Um, uh, a quick question from Scott. Uh, are we able to change 3D object color to help differentiate objects? Uh, because everything's kind of gray. Um, I think Rob's going to go through, there are some objects that have color to them. You can kind of see in the drapes area, right? You've got a black, a burgundy, a gray, a tan. Um, Tony asked this earlier in the session, and I kind of dodged it. Um, so I, I messaged Lowell, so I'm, I'm allowed to say this. Uh, 3.1 software, which we're working on right now, will include textures for objects, including stock objects. So you'll be able to add textures um, and change uh, color. So that's coming in 3.1. Um, but currently, currently the answer is is no. Unless, uh, sorry, correct. Unless they're defined over here, which in our, we'll, we'll get to some in a second, but it is what it is when you drop it in in 3.0. Yeah, and, and Tony said exactly what I was about to cover, which is you can put color and shade and texture on an object in something like Vectorworks, um, and it will retain it when it comes in, as long as the file format supports it, which is why we recommend Collada. Um, so uh, give it a try in Vectorworks and, and bring it in. Um, uh, let me see if there's anything else. Um, Uh, yeah, Phil is is saying that uh, is asking uh, if it's better to try and use as much of the assets that Augmented has in the library as opposed to making them from scratch. Um, kind of, you know, some of the some of the stock objects, all of our library objects are as simplified as possible. There's not a lot of complicated things uh, in the models. You know, when Rob goes through the other models, we have kind of stock objects for all sorts of things. Um, those are super simplified to keep the triangle countdown. Um, as we've said in other sessions before, you just want to be really careful when you're downloading other things from the internet. You know, if you're like, I want to find a couch, and you download that as a 3D object from online, those objects tend to have a lot of detail in them that you probably don't need, and all of that detail um, eats up processing space. So um, if you were to draft something, let's say in, in Vectorworks, um, you're probably going to only draft the detail level that you actually need. That's probably fine. But be aware of things that you're provided uh, from other designers, like a scenic. They may have pulled it from online. Um, and, and also just be aware, aware of the things that you pull from online. Uh, you can import them, but Augment is going to need to calculate every single one of those triangles. So Rob and I have an example from from early on where like an object came in and it had like, it had screws and threading and bolts and stuff, um, which is completely unnecessary for, for the kind of work we do here. Do you have anything to add to that, Rob? Uh, 
I'll just point out the, the triangle counter up here, which I think we've shown in the previous session. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have a, a button up here that shows you. So total triangles, 500, that's, that's a really small number. Um, so you can kind of use this if, if your model is dragging, it will tell you, you know, if, if I had one door that was 15,000 triangles, that would be a, a red flag of, oh, what's what's going on here? Oh, yeah, I don't need to, to see the threading on on the doorknob bolts. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Very good. Um, that's sort of all the uh, sorry. Uh, Don is asking if the uh, maximum triangle count changes based on EOS device. Um, we don't ever cap your maximum triangle count. We'll try and calculate it. Um, we set the bar at 200,000 just as a, a way to metric it. That's where we see um, the system performs pretty well. But yeah, obviously with uh, higher uh, horsepower graphics uh, equipment, you're, you're going to uh, be able to render more. Um, but I would assume you'd want to render more lights and not more threads. That's, you know, so, but a good question. And then uh, Seth pointed out as well, when, if you are importing objects from other libraries on the import, and I think we covered this in our back to work session, maybe we didn't, um, there is a remove small meshes checkbox mm -hmm. and you can set, you can set a size so that can kind of eliminate very tiny details. It'll you know, smooth those over, get rid of those triangles um, when you're importing things. So when yeah. when you do import, I know this question is about how you don't have to import things. Um, but when you do when you do import things, they're at the point of import. You have one chance to you know select your origin from a few choices and uh, make it a little less graphics heavy. Very good. Uh, I think that is all the stuff we have that is pertinent to this section. Um, so uh, why don't we move on? Yeah. yeah. So I've just got. Uh, I really don't have any more examples. I'll drag in some more objects. I just wanted to take a, a quick tour of the stock objects in the library here, uh, and then we'll spend a, a little time on uh, a few specific ones. So I'll close those down. Um, okay. So at the top we have architecture. I, I'm not going to sit here and read all of these to you all, uh, but there's some. You know, things you might find in, in buildings or uh, homes, drape we've already looked at, uh, furniture. So, again, I mentioned this at the beginning, but, you know, there's a couple different tables, there's a couple different chairs. If it's not exactly the chair that you have, is it good enough? Is the seat of the chair about as high as the seat of a chair? And, and you can scale all of these objects. So, if you need a 16 foot long table, you can take the table we have and just scale the Y and now you have a, a, a larger table, uh, for example, or a taller lamp or any of these objects. Um, there, there is a music section, which I think we've used in a previous session um, for musicians and some basic instruments and things. There's a lot of speakers. I don't know what sound person did Jim Umpoff like get in here and put some objects in. Um, and then objects is kind of our, our catch-all, uh, the, the bear taxidermy. Everyone laughs at that one. Like that's probably our most unnecessary one in the in the whole thing. Um, we've got ladder rugs, TV stands. Um, we've got some outdoor objects. If you have any outdoor scenes um, on the show or event you're working on, we've got a couple of different people we can bring in. Um, one has Birkenstocks on. Don't know where that came from. Uh, shapes, I'll come right back to. Um, truss, uh, I know we just looked at this, but just to, to hammer this one home. So uh, there's a ladder. Um, rectangle and square, as far as I can tell, are basically the same. Um, what's, one is the, uh, the Y and the Z are slightly different. In the square, they're the same. Um, and then uh, triangle truss, uh, and then ladder truss as well. So those are all in there. Um, and then venues we've, we've already gone through. So let's come back to shapes here. So the there are 2D shapes. I'm not going to spend uh, much time on this part today, but if you do need uh, a plane, for example, you can you can bring that in. Um, the the reason I actually started to use this for um, for this session, and well here I'll just I'll just show y'all. So the reason I decided not to was I'll bring in this 
blue one, um, is I, I was thinking about using this instead of the cube for our side of the proscenium. So obviously I need it to be uh, rotated vertically. But when I do that, if I go to change the size, um, my, my Y is now my height instead of my Z being my height. And my Z is my depth, which I, I can't change it here because it's a, it's a plane, it's a 2D object. Um, so when it comes in, you know, this way, obviously Z is up and down, but those are locked to the object. So personally, I didn't like the fact that I had to think about what which way it uh, came in versus which way I have rotated it. So that's why I chose to use a, a cube and make it really skinny um, on, on one dimension. Um, not that there's not uses for these, um, but that is a, a limitation of them. So I'm going to delete that. Uh, and again, uh, these have some different color options here. They're the, no, so none of the objects, like the, the well, props, like the doors and the tables and the bare taxidermies, like none of those have color options right now. We've mentioned that that'll be around in 3.1. So it's just these these shapes that have our different colors um, and the, the drapes, as we noticed earlier. So I'm going to close up our 2, 2D store here. Whoops. Good work, Crane. Uh, let's open up our 3D. So I do want to just drag one of each of these in because uh, I think the, these can be transformed to be really useful. And I'll try to do different colors of each one. So actually what I'm going to do is move our proscenium out of the way. Okay. So I'm going to bring in my blue cone. We'll just zoom down there. So we've got a cone object. Yeah, uh, and scaling. I think there's some creative things we can do with scaling on on all of these. So I can you know, make it nice and wide one way. So that's hard to see my view, but now it's a kind of a shallow cone. I can make it tall and skinny. So you know anything. If you need any sort of cone shaped object, you could turn this into it. You know, I can flip it upside down have an upside down cone. So anything you might need you know, uh, for that for. Uh, cube, we've already looked at, but I'll, I'll bring one in here. Uh, I think in a previous session, I used this as a, a platform, like a drum riser. Um, so, you know, we can shrink it down to whatever our drum riser height, you know, a four by eight by eight inch tall platform. Cubes are super useful. We can kind of make those, turn those into anything we need anything we need them to be. Let's get those out of here. Uh, the cylinder, we'll go green here. So it comes in vertically like this. Of course, we can rotate it if we needed to have a... Oh, so we're going to have the same issue there as the plane. So that is our Z. We are locked into that. Um, but if we needed any sort of cylindrical object, we have that option there. Get out of here, cylinder. The prism, uh, I'm actually going to come back to. I want to show uh, something else first. Um, so the, and actually we'll do pyramid as well. So here, let's, let's do that. So let's jump down to wedge here for a second. Uh, we'll do a yellow wedge. So this is great for ramps. Um, so we can scale this, you know, now I've got a nice, you know, it's about a, well, that's 24 feet uh, ramp of any width, any, any height. So I think wedges are, are super useful for basic set pieces. Again, these are representational objects. We can pick a color that's close enough um, and we can drop that in and get it much faster than the process of drafting it in CAD and, and importing it over if that works for for your show. So the so next, uh, I'm going to go up to prism. So a prism is basically uh, two wedges back to back is how I how I think of it. So I can do this. So if I have a a set piece that you know peaks in the middle, um, that's effectively what it is. Um, it does have to be symmetrical. If you had 
if you needed two wedges that were different sizes, you could butt them up to each other and have them be different sizes. Um, but that's essentially what it is. That's the prism. And then the pyramid, we'll do a, a blue pyramid. And let's move it to where we can see it. Um, similar to the prism, um, but all uh, it has four sides on the top, where the prism only has two sides on the top. So if we scale this a little bit, it might be a little hard to see, but there are four faces. If I, if I look straight down, there's four faces um, instead of just the two on the prism. So that's the difference, just, just like a real pyramid. If we scale it back down, it might be a little easier to, to see if we rotate around there. And then we have a sphere. Where'd my origin go? And again, it comes in as a, as a true sphere. We can scale the whole thing and make it larger, but then we can also uh, change one dimension at a time that so we can make it oblong or anything, anything we might need. And then the last one is a good one. So here's our, our torus, which I will admit I had no idea what that was until I brought this in. Uh, it's, it's basically a donut. So or if you're from uh, New Braun Falls, Texas, you might think of it as an inner tube uh, to go down the river. So we've got our our tire swing, our, our donut, whatever you want this to be, uh, and we can elongate that in either direction and make it taller as well. Zoom out, there we go. So we've got kind of a nice uh, cylinder with a hole down the center. Um, we, we have a barrel object, but if you needed some sort of uh, basically a cylinder, a, a tube, you could you could create one out of this um, as well. Um, and then my my very last just little tip would be um, since we don't have a um, a tape measure tool currently, uh, sometimes I will let's go back to a venue instead of out here in abstract space with our objects. And I missed my uh, my curtains, but that's okay. Um, I, I will use either a uh, you can do a pipe because it's easy, but I like to do um, a cube and I'll make it real skinny. And I think cubes are really useful because I can pick the color of it and make it real obvious. So if I drop in this cube and slide it over here, forgot we weren't on the origin. My cube go. Here, we can use that one. Um, I can use this as a measuring device. So let's zoom back over there. So if I take this object and I give it some dimensions, maybe I want it to be uh, six foot wide, just a six foot thick, and then maybe a foot square. Just um, I now have a, a measuring device. So if I need to place scenery. Um, if I'm spacing things apart, or if I'm not sure, if I'm, if I'm not able to use my my tools that are built in here, I can use this as a rough tool of measurement. Like I know it is six feet um, from there to there, and obviously I can change this um, at, at any time. You know, maybe, it, maybe it needs to be 20 feet. Now I have a 20 foot measuring stick. So just, uh, more for building your model than placing in your model, but just a little trick that I've found uh, that can help with with building your space. That's that's everything I had for my presentation. Uh, any other questions coming in? Yeah, um, uh, Ronald asks if the prism could be used as a roof. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Sure. I also the, the other thing that um, is useful, I think you mentioned uh, the wedges. Those are great for rake stages. So if you've got a rake, uh, a quick way to set that ground plan or that ground plane is uh, by doing just one big old wedge. Yep. yep. Yeah. I'm sure 
you know, as we as people start to play with this, we'll get all sorts of cool ideas and kind of standards that, that crop up. Yeah, that looks like a roof to me. Yeah, good enough. Um, da, 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 da. Let me see what else we have that's related here. Uh, Tony asks if there's an area in the ETC forums where they can upload augmented models to share with other people, or would it be a better idea for Facebook? Um, I don't think we have a dedicated place to upload that stuff, um, but we can look at that. I think uh, the Facebook group gets a lot of traffic, and they have a Dropbox attached to that. That may not be a bad place to do it. Um, I kind of expect long term that a lot of these things will be part of tech packages for venues. So, yeah, for sure. Um, a couple of things uh, that that I'll say that I know are on the list to do. Jeff was asking just about continuing the the complicated um, fixture pipe discussion, um, being able to just drop fixtures directly on the pipe. Uh, I know on the wish list is to be able to create uh, positions, take an object and make it a lighting position like you can do in Vectorworks. Um, so I don't know how that's going to look, but I know that it's been asked for. Um, and then uh, uh, Brad was asking if there are any plans for augmented to pull pipe position from foundation. Uh, so currently, we have a magic sheet object that gives you uh, height information um, in EOS. So uh, there's already a link that's there, and we're always working on new integrations between our products. So I think that's what I can say for that. Um, this is an interesting one, uh, Rob, if, if maybe you want to clarify. Uh, if scale is not one, but you change size to five feet, is it really five feet? Do you want to cover that? If scale is not one, let's uh well here, let's go to something that has nested things. That's, yeah, I'm assuming that's the question. Yeah, I think so. When yeah, I'll, I'll, while you're looking for that, Rob, I'll explain from a from a uh I've dragged an object directly into, you know, out of the library and implemented. Um every time you add something from the library, it's always gonna be a scale of one, right? We're, we're bringing that object in at the size that it was was drawn at, right? So if I've got a five foot cube, let's say as an object, um, it's really gonna be five feet because it's come out of the library, it's a scale of one. If I adjust either the measurement or the scale, then that object, those two fields are linked. Um, so an object that doesn't live nested under any other objects, um, scale and, uh, and actual size, actual dimensions are always tied together. Um, so did you have a nested uh, example, Rob? Yeah, so I'm just looking at our proscenium here. So I've grabbed the stage, which is the floor. Um, so its size is 107 by 50, which we set earlier. And you know, I'm double checking the bounds because that's kind of the, the, the world size, uh, if you will. Um, and you can see our scale is higher than than one because it came in you know if we change this to one it'll go back to what it was when we brought it in which was 57 feet by 35 feet so that that size is the is the real size um again if uh we had now we had one that was different yeah i can't remember where that was that's a scale of one we had one where the bounds was different than the size. Was it in our black box? I'm just trying to. Yeah, I think it was. It was in uh, our black box. Yeah. Our doors are way out there still. So this is still. Oh, oh. so if we expand that. Yeah, so here's one. So the are the walls different? Yeah, so here's one where the the bounds are different than the size. So if we grab, say, that upstage wall, 
we added um, the the scale is 1.4, the size is 58 feet, but the bounds are 70 feet. So the reason these are different is our scale on the parent object is not one because we we'd scaled that. Um, so I believe if the parent object scale is one, then you won't have this issue. So so what we're seeing is the the bounds are 1.2. It's that multiplier times the size. Uh, I believe that math is correct. Yes, that looks right. 60 times 1.2 is 72. Um, so a uh, best practice might be to just leave your parent object at a scale of one if this is a concern to you, which it tripped me up today. So that's that's what I would do. Um, so the, the reason this is different is after we built it, then we scaled the whole thing, um, which for, for a venue is probably not something I would expect you to do. Your venue is not going to all of a sudden grow 20% from when you drafted it. Um, with objects, it's, <laughs> uh, with objects, a lot of times you might be eyeballing it, um, or if you know if you don't have an exact height, like oh that's about how tall that actor is, kind of thing. Um, so. Yeah, that would, my recommendation would be keep your parent uh, scale at one, unless there's a, a compelling reason to do so. And if there is, that's fine. But just know that it will have this effect on the on the children objects. Hope that answers that question. Was clear to me. We'll see. Um, uh, talking about sort of pipes that are angled again. If you're if you're hanging fixtures, um, how would you go about? Uh, Hanging fixtures kind of evenly spread along that pipe. What would you What would you do? Yeah, so that uh, which we did a silly example of this before, and I was like, no one will ever need this, but and yet here we are. Where this is a real thing. Um, so we can here. Let's let's see how I, how well I can do this in in real time without ever without ever doing it before. So if we rotate uh, our pipe at I'm gonna, I'm gonna make my life a little easy and do it at 45, um, or maybe negative 45. That is quite an angle. Um, so in uh, when we position fixtures, uh, we can do a, a range of uh, of orientation, just like we can a range of uh, sorry, we can do a range of position over any of the dimensions, including the z. So we could say the first picture, if we know the, the you know, where that node or, or cube, whatever we placed object was there, we could have that first picture there. And then we can say through uh, the the top degree. So, and that's done in patch. So let me just show that real quick. So if we select these four fixtures, and we position them, um, if we say slash slash to ignore the X, Y for now, at you know, 10 feet through slash slash, I don't know, 30, 35 feet. Uh, you'll see their, their Z dimension was scaled. And then if we come back over here and find those fixtures, which were in our black box. I have too much stuff. Where's our black box? There we go. And then where do those fixtures go? I had one extra thing selected there. Where are our fixtures? I didn't change their X and Y. Oh, because I'm grabbing pipes and not pictures. There we go. So and they so their focus hasn't changed, so they look a little wonky focus because they're retaining their orientation. Um, but we have fanned their uh, their Z over the the pipe. So again, this looks like more than a 45 degree angle. Um, if I had that. Uh, 
those, those points, the dimensions of the each end of the pipe, I could start there. And even if the fixtures weren't at those positions, I could then select one fixture, switch to local uh, origin, I believe would allow me to do it. And then it's not doing what I want. If it was nested to the pipe, would that work, Nick? Uh, yeah, I think it would. Or am I just looking at this from the wrong angle? Like, we got all sorts of angles going on here. Yeah. And while you're looking at that, Ronald uh, yeah. asks if you could hang the pipe horizontal and then nest the fixtures and then rotate the pipe. I think that's exactly what we're talking about is you could do that, but your <laughs> orientation for those pictures would stay the same. So either change the orientation you have to doing the yeah. Yeah, focus yeah. them after you get them set. Oh. Um great. Uh I want to work in some of these eddies with all these diagonal pipes. I know, right? Like ten Um uh that was kind of the, the bulk for for what we were talking about today. Um, I, I just want to answer a quick question from Jeff about um, PARs and not having selections for WFL, MFL. Uh, that's, your, you know, your, your second statement, uh, you're correct in that, like, we handle all of that with degrees in augmented um, because, you know, WFLs between different manufacturers can actually be different as well. Um, so find the degrees that are on the cut sheet. We only do round beams right now. We don't do ovular beams. So for pars, um, pick a direction um, and read up on field angle versus beam angle and use whichever one you deem appropriate. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of the big stuff. Uh, Sean wants to know in the future, uh, will, uh, will we be able to have the menu tools um, be able to be selected by uh, by keyboard shortcut. Um, I don't know that that's been talked about, but I'll add that to a list to talk about, Sean. Um, but I think that's most of the questions. Do you have any other parting shots for the end of the day, Rob? I think that's all I had. Um, yeah, that's, that's everything I had. Thanks for coming, everybody. And uh, be back here in two weeks for Nick's session on OSC. Very good. Thanks, everybody.